So our two next speakers are two debaters, um, Tim Ingold and Frédéric Keck. Uh, Tim Ingold is professor of uh, anthropology at the University of uh, Aberdeen. Um, he is one of the most uh, prominent uh, contemporary anthropologists, along with uh, well, names like uh, Viveros de Castro, Philippe Descola in France, or Marshall Salins, um, Marlene Strathern. And uh, he likes to describe his uh, research work as combining the three A's, which are um, anthropology, archaeology, art, four, oh sorry, four A's, art and uh, architecture. And um, he, well, he has uh, published several books, and the last th uh, three ones are uh, the um, perception of the environment, in uh, 2000, Limes in 2007, and the last book is uh, Being Alive in uh, 2011. And it is uh, that book that, uh, or at least the prologue of the book, which will be the point of departure of the, of the debate. And I will quickly introduce uh, uh, Frédéric Keck as well, who is a philosopher and an anthropologist. And he's uh, currently a researcher at the CNRS. Uh, he's a member as well of the uh, Laboratory uh, of Social Anthropology at the Collège de France and member of the International Center of uh, Contemporary French Philosophy, which is located at the UNS here. Um, he has uh, written a book on Lucien Lévy-Brûle. And this book actually is extracted from his uh, PhD uh, thesis. Um, he has uh, written uh, three books on, if I'm not mistaken, on uh, Lévi-Strauss. Uh, Lévi and um, the last book is uh, entitled uh, Un monde grippé in 2010. And it's, uh, well, it's an anthropological uh, investigation on the uh, avian flu, which uh, uses several... Um, um, anthropological concepts like the concept, the Levi-Straussian concept of mythology. Um, what else? Uh, the, well, you also draw upon uh, Paul Rabineau and, uh, of course, Descola and Latour, because uh, the 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 avian flu is linked with the question of the relationship between animals and humans. So. Uh, Thank you very much for having accepted the invitation. And um, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And the speech is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here and having me. It's a great pleasure for me, too. I'm just going to talk for uh, about 20 minutes just to introduce the main themes of the prologue to this book uh, I just mentioned called Being Alive. And, and I start with my own definition of, of, of what I think anthropology is. Um, I, I believe that, that anthropology is or should be a generous, uh, open-ended, uh, critical and comparative inquiry into the conditions and possibilities of human being in this world that we all inhabit that actually means that there, I think there's a difference between anthropology and ethnography, but I won't go into that. But it's a, in that sense, it's a very philosophical endeavor. Indeed, another definition of anthropology might be philosophy, philosophy uh, with the people in, um, as distinct from the kind of philosophy that tends to leave the people out. So in that definition of anthropology, uh, which is generous and open-ended, in a sense speculative, I've wanted to move to a more open-ended view of life in general. My worry or my concern with much contemporary anthropology is that it starts with a view of life which says that uh, human beings, uh, because of their capacity for culture, can live in a thousand different kinds of ways, but as Clifford Geertz once put it, they end in the end having lived in only one. Uh, 
So the vision of human life that uh, anthropology has subscribed to until quite recently is one in which human beings are born with a huge capacity, a huge, a huge possibility for, for flexibility, but life is a gradual process of filling up those capacities and narrowing down those possibilities. So it's a movement from openness to closure. I want to put that the other way round and think of life as a movement of opening up, that wherever uh, life is going on, there must always be loose ends. There must always be things that are not connected up, where people can carry on and keep, keep the process going. And in thinking about how one might produce an anthropology of life in this sense, I've found that I, I've moved in my own work through four fairly distinct phases um, that's, that's thinking about my own work over the last 20 or 30 years even. The, in the first phase, that was mainly in the late 1970s and during the early 1980s when anthropology was very much taken up with the neo-Marxist movement, I was thinking primarily about the meaning of production. What does it mean to say of human beings that they are producers of their existence? And so I was going back to what Marx and Engels were having to say about that. Then I found that that then led me to a next question in the next phase. Well, what does it mean to say that human beings, perhaps alone among animals, have history? Or what kind of history is it that only humans have? Uh, and what meaning should we attach to history? In particular, how should we distinguish, if at all, between history and evolution. So I was thinking about those sorts, of those sorts of questions, and in doing so, I found that I needed to move to an idea of history which was not in any way limited to humans, but which was about the way in which people, through their activities, create the conditions in which they and their successors can grow to maturity. And that led me to think about history as a process of dwelling. So that the third phase of my work, um, largely during the 1990s, I was really thinking about what it means to say of, the, of human life that it is a process of dwelling in the world. And of course, in that uh, connection, I was reading uh, Heidegger and other phenomenologists to see what they had to say about that. The conclusion of those investigations was that we, should, we have to think of human life and human dwelling primarily in terms of movement rather than place, so that life is lived along paths rather than in places. And that led me to this idea of life as a process, process of wayfaring. And it was that idea of wayfaring, of life live as a movement or, or a dwelling as a process or a movement along a way of life that led me to the idea that life is fundamentally lived along lines. And that was the fourth phase of my work, which I'm in now. Uh, so, and at the moment, I'm fascinated by the whole idea of lines and linearity and what a line is and how lines manifest themselves in different kinds of of movement. So what I'll do very quickly is to run through each of those four stages, production, history, dwelling, and lines. So I started with production, and my concern then, and this was, was a long time ago in the, in, in the early 1980s um, when I started looking at human, non-human relations, and I was trying to understand in what sense uh, Marx and Engels, for example, could say that humans were distinguished from all non-human animals in that they produce their uh, mode, their means of life. You remember there's a classic distinction that animals only collect, human beings produce. What on earth uh, did they mean by that? And Marx is very clear that what they mean by that is that a human being, unlike a spider or an ant or a, um, or, or a beaver, uh, starts with an image in mind of what they're going to produce and ends with that thing already produced. And, but the trouble is that it sent Marx round in the circles so that um, he had a circle of production and consumption like this. And, sorry, I've written that the wrong way. 
He had an idea. I'll start again. He had an idea of the, ob the idea and the object. The idea is in my head. I impose the idea on raw material in production or making. And then, where does the idea come from? Well, Marx argues it actually comes from consuming objects. From consuming objects, you get ideas about what they should be like, which then motivate the productive process. So it seemed that Marx was caught up in a circle like this, from which you couldn't get out. And yet he insisted that production was the primary thing. So how could he, how could he deal with that? And his answer, as I understood it, was that um, there is actually more to production than just converting an idea into an object. There is a process of transforming yourself in the process of skills, labor, and attention, and transforming the world in the process. So you start thinking about production, not in terms of the, the fact that there was an idea behind it, but in terms of the fact that it is a form of attentive engagement with one's surroundings, which is both productive of new stuff, but is also transformative of the producer. So I came to the idea then that, um, that, uh, that in production, it is not so much that people or producers transform the world, but the production is part of the process in which the world is transforming itself. And, and the most fundamental point that came out of all this was a distinction between transitive and intransitive senses of production. By transitive sense, I mean... Uh, you start with an idea and you end with an object. I make a tool. I build a house. I produce. So you start here and you end there. A tra an intransitive relationship is like this. Uh, so this could be like I make something. I make an object. I live. I work. I dwell. Uh, that's an intransitive verb. It's a sense the production is a process that is continually going on. It doesn't start here and end there, but is continually moving through. And this, this distinction between a transitive sense of um, making, producing, planning, and an intransitive sense of hoping, growing, dwelling has run through the whole of my argument. So then I moved on to the question of, of history and what we might mean by history. Um, and I started off with uh, Maurice Godelier, uh, who was uh, writing uh, a lot in the, this was around about the, uh, the mid-1980s, and Godelier's work was being translated into English, and uh, we are all reading about uh, Marx again. And Godelier, in, um, in one of his works, uh, makes a distinction between what he calls uh, big H and little h history. This is uh, the same in... Uh, like that. This little h history is the sort that all living beings have. It's the same as uh, the, what used to be called natural history and what Darwinians would understand as evolution. And it's not a history that organisms have made themselves. It's a history, really, of just what has happened to them through processes of variation under natural selection. Whereas humans alone have big H history, which for Godelier was the process in which human beings make society. So, or human beings produce society. So I thought, do human beings produce society? No, they don't. My argument against Godelier was human beings do not produce society. Human beings produce themselves and one another. That is, they produce the process of social life. You don't start with some humans and end with the society. You start with humans who are then carrying on a process of, of social life. And that led to the idea that our humanity itself is not something that is given. It doesn't come with our 
uh, genetic heritage or cultural heritage or anything else like that. Our humanity is something we have continually to work at. It's a, it's a project, a never-ending project. And I got that idea from the philosopher Ortega y Gasset, who argued a long time ago that um, he said, man has no nature, what he has is history. A lot of anthropologists took that to mean that the oh, culture is more important than nature, and that is not what Ortega meant. What he meant was that, uh, that w whatever we might call nature is something that we have continually to be creating, and that continual creation of who and what we are is itself the historical process. Life, as he says, is a task. And I then proceeded to extend that notion of... of um, of the task of life and history into the process of um, organic evolution in order to try and show that there is no, in the end, there is no difference between the historical process and the evolutionary process, that what we call human history is part of a process that is going on throughout the organic world, and that is the process whereby organisms, through their actions, set up the conditions for them and their successors to grow to maturity. Um, but that re requires us to completely rethink the biological theory of, um, of evolution. Uh, anyway, that then led me to the concept of, of dwelling. Actually, it was not Heidegger that led me to think about dwelling. It was Marx. I was, again, going back to Marx and thinking of his famous story about the architect and the bee and how the architect starts with an idea in his mind, whereas the bee has uh, no such idea. And I was trying to think about the difference between that view and the view of production as the continual production of one's own existence. I was already thinking about this difference between transitive and intransitive senses of production. And I was trying to think, what word can we use to describe the notion of production as a process of life that is carrying on. And I thought, well, there's this word to dwell. That would do very well. And then somebody pointed out that there was this guy, Heidegger, who had written, um, he was actually an architect, who said, yeah, I should really read this essay by Heidegger. So I read the essay by Heidegger, most of which I could not understand, and I still, most of which I still do not understand, but I did get this bit about um, about building and dwelling. And that then became very fundamental to, to, to the argument I tried to develop in which I set up a distinction between what I called uh, the... I don't like it very much now, but I, I set up a distinction between what I called the dwelling perspective and the building perspective. In the dwelling perspective, you, you say that, that, people, uh, that, that the forms people build whether in their imaginations or on the ground, emerge from their involvement in a, a world around them. The building perspective takes the opposite view, namely that human beings impose their ideas onto a world that's outside them. And, and you know that all very well from, from Heidegger. It doesn't mean that the dwelling perspective does not mean that humans don't build it simply means that we need a different account of building, not as an imposition of ideas onto raw material, but as a, a working with materials. In fact, it's a critique of the standard hylomorphic uh, model of making that we've had since Aristotle. And, it, and then it seemed to me that, um, that the opposition between building and dwelling is analogous to the opposition between making and weaving. And I started thinking of, of, of how you could Im imagine uh, social life as a, as a kind of process of, of weaving uh, and, and how that would help to shift our attention from thinking in terms of the relation between objects and images to a better understanding of uh, material flows and currents of sensory awareness. It's still... Uh, it's equivalent from, to going from this view to, to that view. Um, if I could put it a bit more clearly, um, 
The trouble with most anthropology, I thought, was that it was still thinking in terms of a, of a model of making or building, which started with the image here and ended with the object there. But I wanted to think that the image itself is just a, mo it's just a moment in a process of, of sensory awareness, and the object is just a moment in the flow of materials. And so instead of looking at the relation, instead of going backwards and forwards and looking at the relationship between images and objects, I wanted to go this way and look at the relationship between sensory awareness and here and materials, flow of materials. And that, that looked like making or building, and that one looks like weaving. So I'm shifting from this way of looking at things to that way of looking at things. And this, of course, is the process of life. So that's the way my thinking was going. I did have some... I'm, I'm, I'm not a Heideggerian, and I had a lot of problems with Heidegger. Uh, so, so far as I could understand it, um, I, I don't agree with the way in which Heidegger distinguishes between the human and the non-human, and I don't agree with the way in which he tries to deal with, um, with the idea of the open. What I have been trying to do is to show how one can bring together an ecology that focuses on relations between organisms and their environments, and a phenomenology that starts with the notion of being in the world, and to try and show how you can really bring those two together. And obviously, to bring them together, you have to abandon the very sharp division that Heidegger makes between Dasein as human and everything else, which I think is incoherent. My conclusion from that was that inhabitants you know, get to know the world by moving about in it. And, and that movement is absolutely central to perception. And I got that idea from a completely different source, and that was James Gibson's writings on uh, ecological psychology that I've been reading for some time, since the middle of the 1980s. So I, started, I put Gibson and Heidegger together, which is a strange thing to do, because they could hardly be more different uh, in, the, in, in ways of thinking. Um, but, but I wanted to bring together uh, Heidegger's idea about dwelling with Gibson's the perception, the, the idea that perception is fundamentally about movement. But there is a problem in Gibson's account of perception in that although the perceiver for Gibson is moving around in the world, the world that is perceived seems to be virtually static. In other words, he has... Uh, G Gibson has the perceiver moving around in this world that is full of environmental objects which have certain fixed patterns and arrays as though the environment itself is stuck. Something, something has gone wrong somewhere. Uh, and uh, in order to, to deal with that problem, I found myself going back to uh, Meloponti and Meloponti's idea that, um, that, that whilst the, to perceive we have to move the world that we perceive is also moving as well. And the, the key point I took from Meloponti is that our perception of the world is part and parcel of the world's perception of itself, which is another way of saying that the, inhabitant, the inhabited world is a sentient world and that it is not possible, it would not be possible for us to exist as sentient beings in a world that is itself insentient. And that was the problem with Gibson. Gibson had the perceiver as sentient, but the world that was being perceived was insentient. Uh, but Meloponti uh, brings back the, what he would see as this reversibility so that one, one, can be, one can and one can only be sentient in, in, a, in a sentient world. So putting all that together, I came to the conclusion that to dwell is to be embarked upon a movement a longer way of life, uh, and therefore that production itself is a process of wayfaring, and every mode of wayfaring is itself a mode of production.
production. So instead of thinking as Heidegger tended to think of, um, as, of, of dwelling as, as, as in a place, and he often seemed to think of this place as very bounded. It was, a, it was this uh, clearing in the forest. You know, it had be lots of trees and, and, and around here, and he would be the, the peasants dwelling in the middle of it all, and there, there he is in there. In this, in, this, in this bounded place. And I wanted to say, no, actually, um, dwelling takes place along a path. So we should, if we want to draw a, a person, we should draw it like that, not like that. Um, and that's what got me to the idea of lines. Because so often in, um, in anthropology and other social science disciplines, people say, let's imagine a human being called him A. Let's another, imagine another human being called him B. Oh, and then they interact. And then they're perhaps part of a larger whole, which you might call society and so on. But in simply drawing these circles, we've already introduced an assumption that a human being is somehow closed in on itself. And I thought, what would happen instead if we drew an, a human being like this? Here's one human being. It doesn't have an inside or an outside. It's just the movement. Oh, and here's another one. So what's going on there? So that's what made me begin to think about, about human life as, as being um, lived along lines. And that's what I'm thinking about now. Um, long ago, in the early 1980s, um, I was reading uh, Bergson and Whitehead. Uh, in those days, the, when I went to get, uh, when I picked up Bergson's Creative Evolution, L'Evolution Creative, from, from our university library, the last person who had taken it out was in 1930 something. And they opened it up and I sneezed because of all the dust and the rest of it. And I read this book and, I, and it blew my mind. It, was, it had everything that I wanted to say. And I was so enthusiastic about it, I went to the philosophers I knew, and they all went white in the face. And they said, it's all very well for me as an anthropologist, but they have their careers to think about, and you can't, <laughs> can't mention like, people like Bergson. And so it's interesting how, how things change. But anyway, I read Bergson, I read Whitehead. I was fascinated by Whitehead's idea of concrescence, this idea that, that, that in, the cre in creation is a movement in which things are continually developing beyond them, overtaking themselves is a process of, of becoming. That they want, you, you shouldn't talk about concrete objects, but concrescent objects, objects that are everything in, is a world of becoming. And I was fascinated by uh, Bergson's idea of, um, of duration. And in one place, I think it's in Creative Evolution, Bergson says that the living being... Uh, describes a kind of circle. So I thought we could describe a kind of circle. Here it is. Okay. And that, I've just drawn a line, which is a trace of my gesture. And Bergson thought of the organism as a sort of envelope of a movement of that kind. But as soon as I do that, and you look at the finished drawing, you think, oh, there's a circle. It's got an inside, and it's got an outside, and we should start looking at the relationship between the two. And this was this was um, the, uh, the, the this, this this was a tendency that Bergson was criticising our tendency to treat a living being that is spiralled in on itself as part of a movement to treat it as an externally bounded object. Because as soon as we talk, think of this circle not as the trace of my movement, but as a geometrical figure with an inside and an outside, then the whole way of thinking uh, changes, uh, uh, sort of um, flips over. So it was this kind of uh, line of thinking that led me eventually to, uh, to Deleuze. I, I'd, I, tr I tried reading uh, Mille Plateau at one stage, and I got nowhere. I thought, I cannot understand a word of this guy. I, it's about 500 pages long. I haven't got time with this nonsense. And so I put it aside, 
And people kept saying, you know, you really ought to read this book. <laughs> and, and eventually, I, once I thought of all this stuff about lines, I came back to it and I looked at the treatise on nomadology and I said, damn, he said everything already uh, that I wanted to say because I now sort of figured out what, what it was that, um, that he was talking about. Um, and, and, and the sorts of lines I wanted to talk about, lines like, like this that simply carry on, are precisely the, um, at least in the English translation, are called uh, lines of flight or lines of becoming in, 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 uh, in Mille Plateau. Uh, and, and there's a lovely image that, uh, that Deleuze and Guattari have at one stage in that book of um, a river and the banks, um, which gets back to this. So imagine a river. This is a river. Okay, so this is these are the two banks. You have a bank on this side and a bank on this side, and and here's the water flowing in between. And you can imagine a place here on one side of the river and a place here on the other side of the river, and you could build a bridge, which would enable you to go across from A to B. That that crossing. That establishes a sort of line which we call a point-to-point -point connector. There's no movement in it. It's just, a, it's just a connection across. But the water, the river, is flowing in a direction orthogonal to that. The water is not going from one bank to another. The water is flowing in between the banks. But if it wasn't for that flow of the river, there would be no banks and no possibility of connection between them. And this is, of course, the difference between the transitive and the intransitive senses of production that I started with. So I found in this image the key to what I was looking for, namely that anthropology has forgotten life because it's been concentrating on the connections between the banks rather than the processes that go down in between. And that's basically it. Sorry, I spoke for too long. No, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to take the opportunity of Tim Ingall's passage uh, in Paris uh, to have this uh, discussion with him uh, because we, our, our two lines in some way cross each other. Uh, he's an anthropologist who comes uh, to use his philosophy and comes to Bergson and the question of life. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm a philosopher by training and I, Bergson was the first philosopher that I read uh, intensively and uh, I'm coming to anthropology, and, and life is also a question that is uh, very important for me. So um, I, I, I don't want to talk so much about my work, because I, I think it's really about, about your work that we should discuss. And since this is um, a workshop about uh, philosophy and its others, uh, I, I would like to ask questions about um, uh, the relation between anthropology and philosophy in, in your work and in the text that you presented today. And uh, since I am a philosopher, I, 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 felt, I feel relieved when I find three points. So I have three points. <laughs> but so I would say <laughs> that uh, you have four points. The anthropologists today with their four points are, are happy, and the philosophers still have points. Two, three points. Three points. Four, four. So I would say that um, in the text, that, that in, well, in, in, in your work and in the text that you presented today, there they are two relations between anthropology and philosophy that I would like to discuss, and one that you could find in other anthropologists, and I would like to ask you if, how you would consider it. Um, so uh, to, to go on the first kind of relation between philosophy and anthropology, and I would like to show that each of these three produces different conceptions of life, I would like to uh, come back to the quotation by which you started today, um, and its context, which is, um, uh, I mean, the text in which you give this, uh, this quotation, uh, which is the Companion Encyclopedia of Anthropology that you edited in 1993. Uh, and I, so I give the quote. Um, the best anthropological writing is distinguished by its receptiveness to ideas springing from work in subjects far beyond its conventional boundaries and by its ability to connect ideas in a way that would not have occurred to their originators, who may be more enclosed by their particular disciplinary frameworks. But to this connecting enterprise, it brings something more, namely the attempt 
to engage our abstract ideas about what human, what human beings might be, might be like with an empirically grounded knowledge of certain human beings as they really are and of what for them everyday life is about. This engagement not only provides the primary motivation, apart from the sheer curiosity for ethnographic inquiry, but also carries anthropology beyond the close risks of speculative philosophy. Anthropology, if you will, is philosophy with the people in. So you, you, you gave this, this quotation that is very striking, but it's interesting to see that uh, you, you use it as a discussion with philosophy in its encyclopedic uh, pretension. And I think it's um, uh, this, this rivalry between uh, philosophy and anthropology as encyclopedic discourses about human life. Uh, anthrop so uh, anthropology starts from ethnography uh, as a uh, curiosity for other groups, but it aims to produce uh, a discourse about human life. So of course the an encyclopedia uh, gives ideas about uh, social and economic organization, tool making, language, cognition. You consider all this in your works. And so for you, anthropology doesn't have an object of its own, such as society or culture, but its object is human life uh, in all its aspects. And yet anthropology relies on ethnographic fieldwork, so motivated by curiosity, uh, and not in thought experiments, like philosophy. So philosophy and anthropology have encyclopedic potential, but they have different concepts of experience. And I would like to recall the experience from which you started. Uh, so you, you did uh, ethnographic fieldwork uh, for many years, and I, I, I imagine you still do, uh, with the Sami um, people in uh, Scandinavia, uh, a nomadic uh, society who hunt reindeers, and you asked uh, in your first work, what does it mean for the Sami to follow reindeers? Uh, so reindeers are, are, are both um, uh, wild animals, but at the same time they are part of the environment. Uh, and the uh, Sami have to uh, follow the traces of these reindeers uh, to catch them. Um, and the, your first work are about the difference between hunting uh, and domestication, a pastoralist relation to animals. And you ask questions about the morality of uh, killing for hunting societies. Uh, you, you look at the way they tame the uncertainty of the encounter with the animal. Um, and you show that the, the hunter, contrary to the pastor, has to discover the plan of nature uh, through its unfolding, in, through the encounter with the animal. So the ecology of uh, human-animal relationship in a given environment gives you uh, a singular entrance in the classical problem of uh, philosophy. Uh, what are the common uh, form of uh, human life? What is a good human life? All these questions take a different perspectives when they are seen from the Sami uh, hunters. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested by this work because uh, my, my topic of research now is uh, animal diseases uh, and the way they are uh, uh, tamed by uh, um, industrial societies that kill uh, massively animals when they are uh, sick uh, and the way they're also conceived and perceived by uh, microbiologists who describe themselves as virus hunters. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm also interested in this shift between hunting societies and, and, and pastoral societies in the relation between human and, and animal. Um, so um, the, the, um, uh, this is for the first uh, point, the encyclopedia, encyclopedic dimension of uh, uh, anthropology uh, and philosophy, uh, where uh, you start from this uh, specific uh, uh, ethnographic fieldwork. But there's another uh, relation between anthropology and philosophy that appears particularly in the, in the text you presented today, uh, which is philosophy as a tradition of thinkers uh, who raise uh, problems through concepts. And what you did today was a kind of uh, reflexive uh, return on uh, your um, uh, uh, itinerary, intellectual itinerary, 
how you shifted from uh, production to history to dwelling to lines uh, in your most recent uh, book, and how uh, to do this conceptual move, you had to read authors like Marx, uh, Ortega y Gasset, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, uh, Deleuze, and, and Bergson. Um, so we see that you, you still have the same problem that really comes from your fieldwork, but it's, uh, uh, this problem is uh, uh, solved or thought, thought about through different uh, concepts. Uh, the problem is to understand how life creates forms in a non-teleological way, but in the unfolding of its own process. I, I take this expression out of um, your book on hunters, uh, pastorists, and rangers, because the, the idea of unfolding of its own process uh, that describes the perception of nature by the hunter is really something that kept as uh, what Bergson would call a philosophical intuition through uh, your different uh, works. But um, it, it's interesting that someone who starts from ethnography needs to read uh, philosophers, uh, uh, not for encyclopedic purposes, but to solve problems. Uh, so I wonder um, how you encounter these philosophers. You talked about it in some, like, uh, talking with, with people, going to the library. Uh, uh, these encounters are it's somewhat ethnographic because you even describe the, 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 the dust that comes out mm -hmm. of the book uh, and the discussions you have with your friends and colleagues. Uh, but then, um, uh, how do you consider the thought experiments of these philosophers uh, and, and the difference between these thought experiments and your own ethnographic uh, experiment, experience? Um, I also wonder um, how you can explain this uh, shift in concepts. Um, do you change concepts because there was something in the thought experiment of the philosophers uh, that was uh, restrictive for what <clears throat> you try to think, as when you criticize Heidegger for having a concept of dwelling which is too uh, bonded and uh, localized? Or I is it um, because you met uh, different ethnographic problems um, uh, and also, it, it's interesting that um, the, the relation between these four concepts is not dialectical. Uh, there, you don't talk, uh, when you talk about the relation between idea and object in, uh, in Marx, you don't talk about the contradiction. So you don't try to solve the contradiction by another concept. Uh, but you try to go beyond the opposition to a process uh, that uh, appears uh, as a process of production, but production is not the good term. So is it not the good term because it's the, uh, because uh, philosophical modes are changing or because, uh, 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 because of the encounters you do? Or is it not uh, a good term because uh, the, it, it doesn't, uh, the, the, the tension uh, that you start uh, with is not really um, uh, solved by this term? So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about Contradiction, especially because coming from uh, uh, structuralist uh, mm. training, we, we still use kind of dialectical uh, uh, procedures, even if they are very uh, uh, fine with uh, Levi Strauss's concept of transformation, where you start with uh, little oppositions. Uh, but um, uh, the, the, and, and the, the, these oppositions in, in, in Levi Strauss are also a way to describe the environment. So it's, mm. it's also your problem to uh, describe the, the, the perception of the environment. Um, but maybe one of the ways to um, avoid these quest questions of contradiction uh, and, and dual opposition is, um, is to think not as precisely two opposite terms, but as uh, a, a tension between um, uh, uh, openness and closeness. And um, I, I also, uh, thought that these these four concepts are holistic concepts, um, and I wondered if the way you use philosophy is that is because it it proposes holistic concepts, uh, concepts to describe the, the the total relation of an organism to an environment, uh, but still you don't want um, uh, you don't want a totality you don't want a, a bounded totality, so I, I wonder how you find in philosophy. Um, holistic concept for totalization and not totality. So if you can go back to these four concepts and, and talk a little, about, a little bit about um, uh, this, this question of holism 
and and also the the encounter and at the end uh, how this concept would uh, allow you to criti criticize anthropological models uh, i'm struck by the fact that behind all these models uh, this concept you also have the darwinian model of evolution that you keep referring to as something you try to overcome uh, with these trees, uh, uh, kinship relations, um, and so how do you oppose the, the lines, for example, to um, kinship uh, uh, relations? Uh, and this would also, uh, it's very interesting for my work because in, in the relation I find between humans and animals, I also have a lot of um, of trees, uh, phylogenic trees for viruses that, that flux from one to the other. Uh, so I'm interested in, in, in the way philosophical concepts allow you a uh, critique of uh, anthropological concepts that would be too uh, bounded. Uh, so that's the second point. And then the, the, the third point, uh, uh, so it would be the third relation between philosophy and anthropology that you do not choose. And I wonder why. Um, so I talk about philosophy as um, encyclopedic pretension, uh, uh, and, uh, as a, uh, producing concept to solve problems. But philosophy can also be conceived as a form of training, uh, a tradition, uh, a form of uh, um, writing, uh, of classifying, uh, that you exit through ethnography. And it may be a very uh, classical French topic, uh, uh, to describe uh, the relation between philosophy and ethnography, and you were not trained in that uh, tradition, so it's interesting to ask you uh, your view on this very French move from philosophy to ethnography, uh, which has been described by Bourdieu as a shift from theory to practice, uh, or from Western philosophy to other philosophies. Um, there is this quote by Lévi-Strauss that um, is uh, mentioned by Eduardo Vivero de Castro uh, in his last book, um, so I think it's um, in, in the prologue to the issue of L'Homme in 2000 where he says uh, la, la philosophie revient uh, dans nos études, non pas la philosophie apprise à l'école, uh, dont ma génération a demandé à l'ethnographie de uh, la déprendre, mais par un frappant retour des choses, la leur, so the, the philosophy of um, Amazonian societies for, for Lévi-Strauss. Um, there is, in, in your work, a, a critical tendency when you oppose the lines of the hunter with the line of writing. Uh, and so you, you, you also reflect on your own procedures as someone who writes on other societies. It's all the debate about writing culture. And, uh, and, and in your work, there is a, an effort to uh, introduce in the writing of anthropology other relation to the environment than writing, and it produces for me, a kind of intellectual pleasure in reading your work because you really follow uh, your work in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a walking way. In some, you, you, uh, we, uh, the reader walks with you in the text. Uh, but you don't go as far as uh, crediting the people you study with a philosophy. Uh, so you, 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 you introduce the operations of thinking uh, in, in your writing uh, the operations of thinking of the hunter, for example, in your you know, writing, but you don't introduce the philosophy of others in your own thinking. Mm. And that's, I think that's the main difference. Um, you don't uh, talk about uh, shamanistic cosmologies or metaphysics. Uh, you don't want to coin new terms. I mean, these four concepts that you use, uh, of course, they are uh, tools, uh, they are, so you need to change the tools. But uh, they are not new terms, uh, like uh, animism or perspectivism or multinaturalism and so on. Um, and I wonder if um, uh, the reason why you refuse this kind of relation between philosophy and anthropology is because you refuse to consider life as ineffable, as a, a form of uh, intense, very intense uh, experience. For you, life is everyday life, ordinary life. Uh, and also you still maintain life as an evolution. Uh, even if you want to multiply the lines of evolution, there is still this arrow that uh, pushes you in, in your work. So if you can elaborate on this kind of three relation between philosophy, anthropology, and, and life. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I'll try. And these are, these are very 
Well, thank you, first, the wonderful commentary. And, and these are very difficult, complicated questions which I'm still struggling with. And I, so I don't have um, very clear answers to them. But it turns on the question of, which I mentioned but did not pursue further, on the question of the relation, the difference and the relation between anthropology and ethnography to start with. And my views on that have changed over time. Um, and they've changed in that only, I think, maybe 10, 20 years after doing my first fieldwork among Sami people, did it really begin to dawn on me what I had learned from them. So when I first went to do my fieldwork as part of my PhD, I did what I was told, and I was supposed to be studying kinship and social organization and ecological adaptation, and I collected a lot of data on reindeer numbers and household management and local economies and small-scale politics, and I analyzed it the way an anthropologist is supposed to do, and I drew on whatever theory I needed, and I wrote a not a particularly distinguished book of the kind that anthropologists usually call an ethnography, a particular study of this group of people and what their, what their concerns were. And, and in those days, it was uh, taken for granted that ethnography is what you do in the field. It also refers to the book or the articles you write after you get back from the field. Then, once you've done that, you can move on to the next stage, which is more comparative, and you can set up the results of your fieldwork against the results of other people's field work, start thinking about possible generalizations, and that is more theoretical, and that's like doing anthropology. So the idea is you, you do your ethnography first, and then you move on to anthropology. And, and that's what I thought I was doing. Because so I, I did my study, then and after finishing that, I uh, wrote a book you mentioned it, called Hunters, Pastoralists, and Ranchers, which was a comparative study of um, people who lived with reindeer right across the Circumpolar North. So I was comparing my own material with material from other studies and coming up with some kinds of, of generalizations. Um, all that time, I suppose, in my subconscious, uh, I was... Um, must have been aware that, that I'd learned something from doing this field work which actually challenged the whole way I was doing anthropology in that sort of way. Um, but, and and um, the things I learned that, that I realize now I learned from that field work is about um, the importance of movement about the importance of um, observation and of gaining knowledge through paying attention to what is going on in the world around one. And I learned about how knowledge is something that actually um, grows from the inside of one's being rather than something that is added on top. Um, when I was doing field work, and this... Uh, experience has been reported by many other people who've done field work in northern circumpolar societies. When you are faced with a practical problem, how do I stuff my shoes with hay? How am I supposed to get to this place where the reindeer separation is going to take place? And practical things. The answer always was, no, you know, know yourself. It's, it's, it, it, it's praise, it, it means know for yourself. You know, you're the person who knows. I'm not going to tell you. And, and, and at first this seems very frustrating, and then I realized that, that what they were telling me, what they were trying to get me to understand, was that the way you learn things is not from having other people pass on the information, but actually through your own efforts of trial and error and observation and working things out. And the most that other people can give you is some sort of guidance. Uh, they, they're not going to tell you authoritatively it is like this or it is like that. So what I learned from my fieldwork is a certain notion of how 
knowledge is formed through growth and development of a person in an environment. And I think that that, that was there, sort of driving the way I was thinking. It came out of my field work, but I didn't realize it wasn't part of my sort of ethnographic study because I hadn't realized until much later uh, that it was there. But then I, 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 I can look back now and see that if I hadn't done that field work, then I wouldn't have been thinking in the way that I have been thinking. All of which leads me to think that we should have a quite different way of understanding the relationship between anthropology and ethnography um, in the sense that the objective of ethnography, I think, is primarily descriptive. It is to describe as truthfully and honestly as possible the life, the concerns, the ways of thinking and doing of some group of people at some time. And that is a very honorable thing to do. But that, that goal is descriptive. The goal of anthropology, I think, is transformative. Uh, it, 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 it's about transforming uh, me, you, or whoever, us, the anthropologist, and it's about transforming the world. And these have different objectives. And here's a, an analogy that might help. Um, because I play the cello. And one thing I used to dream of would be, wouldn't it be wonderful? I don't play it all that well, but I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could go and spend a year sitting at the feet of Mrs. Slav Rostropovich? And I would sit there, and I would listen, and I would learn, and maybe watch what he does and try and copy, and maybe he would, maybe he would offer me a little bit of advice here and there. Uh, and after a year, I would come home, and I would be a better cellist. I would understand myself better. I would have a deeper understanding of the, uh, of, uh, of the music. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd have, yes, I'd, I'd, and, a, and a better understanding of, of the instrument. Alternatively, I could have thought, my cello will give me an entry ticket. I want to make a study of Russian cellists in their social and cultural context in the 20th century. So I go along, take my cello with me, and hope that that will you know, buy me a pass to be able to have a conversation with Rostropovich. He says, oh, I see you have a cello. All right, I'll talk to you. And I ask him some questions, and, and he tells me about uh, life, and I write it all down. And then maybe I go and speak to a few other cellists who aren't so famous, and I come back, and I write a book called something like you know, The Highly Strung Bear, Cello and Cellists and Cello Playing in Contemporary Russian <laughs> Society. And, 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 uh, but, and that would be an honorable thing to do as well, but, but it would be quite different from, from doing the first thing. And, and I think that difference is, is, is really the difference between anthropology and ethnography. Um, and it, which mean, it does mean that, that usually we are doing both at once. So we have descriptive objectives and we have transformative obje objectives. But I think those objectives are, are separate. And so when we're thinking about the relationship between anthropology and philosophy, and if we're thinking about anthropology, not ethnography, as, a, as a, something that is very like philosophy, that corresponds in many ways to philosophy, it's that transformative enterprise. So that's where... Um, where the, the, the philosophy, as it were, comes in, so that we don't go to the field to make studies of Rostropovich or the Sami. You go to the field in order to learn from them and come back uh, understanding things that you didn't understand before. But if that is the case, then it means we don't have to be in the field to do anthropology at all. So long as we keep our ears and our eyes open, we could go to um, an art exhibition and come back with new ideas. We could read a book of philosophy and come back with new ideas. And there's no great difference between all those things. Um, and 
that's why now in, 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 in the teaching and writing that I'm doing at the moment, I feel that the, the f most important thing to do is to, is, and this comes to your point about philosophy as a form of training, the most important thing to do is to teach students to be good observers, to actually notice what is going on around and use what their observations to continually f transform their own persons. So we do experiments. Um, in the class on the four A's that I've been running for years, we, um, uh, for, for example, I, I've wanted to uh, get students to understand the difference between thinking of stuff as objects and thinking of stuff as materials. So I get them to bring into class a whole lot of objects and to do, do things with them. The next week I tell them to bring in a whole lot of materials. And then you say, well, why did you think that was an object or not a material? And, then they, and, 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 and through the actual engagement with the stuff, they can get a, a, a sense of the distinction, which isn't just illustrative of what they've read in a book, but is actually formative because it comes through their own experience. We, we make and fly kites and discuss the problem of agency. Why did the kite fly? <laughs> and, 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 and these sorts of things. So that, so that they, we, we go out and, and look at the clouds. I think, what the hell is a cloud? So, so, that, so that you can... You can and, and I think that is, is, is a kind of doing, a, doing of anthropology. Um, so uh, f f f so what that, that implies, in a sense, is that ethnography is one way of doing anthropology, but there are all sorts of other ways of doing anthropology as well, um, such as uh, art, or architecture, or dance, or music. And they, those are, could all be possible ways of, of doing anthropology. So that's the way I'm thinking <laughs> about it at the moment. But it's certainly not the way I thought about it when you know, 20, 20 years ago. Um, where I find that I'm very critical Oh, well, no. One of the things that has happened since the writing culture debate in anthropology is is that um, is is that more and more anthropologists find that they're having to go outside of anthropology to philosophy to find their theory. I mean, the more that anthropology contracts into ethnography, this is what's happening now the more anthropologists are having to go outside of anthropology to find their theory, so they read Foucault or they read uh, mm. Deleuze or whatever it um, might be. Um, and whereas in the past, you know, we had structural functional, we had structuralism, we had Lee Strauss, we had Radcliffe Brown, we had all these people that we would take our, our theory from. And the, the thing that bothers me or troubles me about this is that when, they're actu when anthropologists are actually in the field doing field work, they will say that, of course, this exp that they're learning from the people, that this is a transformative process. But at a certain point, when they leave the field and start writing up and analyzing their material, all of, that, all of those lessons in life turn into data for analysis turn round and and then you say right and now, now I need a now I need a theoretical apparatus to analyze this data and it has to come from outside it has they, so they have to go shooting off to, to philosophies in order to find the stuff to analyze this material and 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 that I think is a betrayal yeah. I think it it, 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 it it's like um, like uh, like like um, allowing anthropology to conform with the model of normal science. To, to say that you know, up to a point, anthropology is, we are, we are questioning, we are questioning the idea that the authoritative knowledge of the world comes from the academy, from the science, where we're actually bringing the knowledge of people in their lives to bear on things. And then we suddenly turn around and say, well, that's just the data. Hmm. Now I'm going to analyze it. And I think that is, that, that, that has, has been very damaging for for anthropology, and that's why I want, would want to criticise it. Just, I haven't stuck exactly to your agenda, but on your last point, why haven't I 
introduced the philosophies of others into my own thinking. Um, the reason is that I, I don't think it is right to, to um, it, it is right to impute uh, philosophies as such. I mean, let's put it another way. Um, in, you, you mentioned shamanism, and in those societies where, where so-called shamanism is practiced, what we call shamanism is actually just a bunch of things that people do. Uh, they do all sorts of things, um, which are pragmatic, which are very situated, a lot of them are very improvisational, think I'll do this, think I'll do that, better deal with this spirit, oh, what's happening here, better dress up, put something on, bang a drum or two. Uh, they're, 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 it's all these sort of bits of stuff that are going on. And, 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 but it's the, uh, it's the orientalizing scholar who comes from outside who says, look at all these weird practices. These must all represent a coherent body of thought, shamanism. So as soon as you move from the shaman to shamanism, you're doing something to those people's practices that is your own doing. It's not part of what they're doing. And it's giving them a, giving a, a kind of systematicity and coherence to life that is not actually there. And in the process, actually closing it up. And, uh, and so I don't think that's, um, that's the right thing to do. I, and, and and even if one's doing philosophy, it's probably not a good idea to say, well, we've got this ism here, and we've got that ism here, and we've got this one here, um, we, the, and, and, and let's sort of draw lines between them and map them out and then see where I am in relation to Nietzsche and Kant. And what, so, <laughs> that, that's not the way to do it. But perhaps the way to do it is just to say, to, to, to say here, here we have um, some people who've written all kinds of things, and uh, let's, let's learn from them and develop some ideas of our own. Uh, that, well, that's not a very clear but, way of putting it, but maybe that's why I'm not a philosopher, <laughs> because I don't follow the rules of, uh, of philosophical inquiry. Maybe I've... One other thing. You mentioned holism and totalization, and, and um, ho holism has been a problem for anthropology for a long time, because anthropology has always wanted to present itself as a holistic discipline. We put together the bits that other disciplines study separately. And anthropologists would say economists study the economy, and theologians study religion, and political scientists study politics, and uh, legal scholars study law. But anthropology is the discipline that shows how politics, economics, law, yeah. and religion um, all relate together, and therefore it studies the whole rather than the parts. And this has been, oh, we, we, the anthropology has always had that as part of its, its disciplinary identity, and yet it has created enormous problems because as soon as it starts talking about societies as, as wholes, uh, you have us and the other, and you're setting up these boundaries that aren't, uh, aren't really there, and you're exoticizing and objectifying other people. And, and, and somehow putting their lives in a box as though our life can go on, but theirs is already shut up. And, and so we've, 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 we've moved uh, beyond that stage to the point in which to, 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 to use a word like holism sounds, it sounds like a dirty word. Uh, mm. It's not a word you're not supposed to use. I think we can be holistic thinkers so long as we distinguish between holism and totalization. And I think they're quite different things, yeah. that, that to, to talk about a totality uh, where everything is all joined up and comprises this thing, this whole that is now complete and fully formed, that is closing things up. It's against the philosophy of openness that I would be advocating. But to say that to think holistically in a, in a sort of Batesonian sense that that w anything you're looking at is uh, sort of spills out into the world in all sorts of ways and can never be viewed as an isolated particle, but as a moment as a, of a process that is going on, then I think that's all right and we can have our holism without having totalization. Yeah.
Yeah, I would have two questions. One is rather anthropological and the other one rather philosophical. So the first one um, concerns the, uh, the fact that you, among other anthropologists, uh, focus on how, and I, I think this is very, very interesting, how when we uh, study, for example, a tribe or people, how they can teach us their techniques, you know, of dwelling, of uh, hunting, and so on. And, um, well, this is, let's say, uh, an anthropological school. And on the other side, we have these anthropologists like Boyer, like Sperber, like uh, Maurice Bloch, who focus not on, um, let's say, the ethnoscience, but on uh, differential uh, processes. And what strikes them the most is not that uh, in their ethno ethnographic field, uh, people teach them uh, techniques, but what uh, strikes them is that when, when they are in, the, in their et ethnographic field, difference is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think this is because there is a geographical uh, bias because uh, all of them studied in Africa. And I think it plays a role. Uh, these societies are more uh, differential, difference has more importance in these societies than uh, maybe in, uh, I don't know, in Amazonia or Siberia. But my question is that, um, Hunting, uh, dwelling, and so on are experimental folk sciences, right? And it's very interesting to learn from these ex uh, experimental uh, sciences. But I think it, uh, it is interesting as well to study uh, the differential aspect of cultures, which it seems to me is not studied uh, so much in your approach. Because in order to learn uh, empirical techniques, you need, let's call that uh, axioms. That is, when you perform an action, when you are in, uh, you know, performing something which is experimental, you have to consider that uh, there are things, material things. And uh, what I mean is that in order to have an experiment, experimental practice, you need to take as granted many things, and this is not uh, susceptible to be demonstrated through an empirical way. So uh, m my point is that uh, in order to, yeah, to learn experimental techniques, you always need um, non-experimental underpinnings, and this is all about differ difference. And, uh, and it seems to me that the advantage of your approach is that we can very clearly um, understand how uh, people can form beliefs and can uh, acquire techniques uh, through experience. But um, yeah, wh what do you think about these uh, non-experimental underpinnings? Okay. So this is the first question. That, yeah. Right. Okay, that's the first. I mean, just, just in terms of the prologue to what you said, it is true that, um, that, that, that the way in which, throughout the history of anthropology, the way in which particular theoretical problems have been framed and have dominated the agenda has been closely related to the kinds of ethnographic settings in which uh, people have worked. So there was a time when I was a student... And British anthropologists were all working in Africa, and so we all had to do kinship theory and corporate groups and so on. Then later on, they were working in Melanesia, and we all had to do the person in an exchange, and then in Europe, and we were all doing nationalism and identity. So, so it's absolutely true that, that, the, that, that, and that, the way, that there is a link between the way in which anthropological theories have been framed and developed and the most widespread uh, ethnographic experience of, 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 of those scholars who've been developing them. And that, that, that's true and interesting <coughs> as to how that, that happened. And from my own point of view, I, I, I think that there are things about doing anthropology in the north 
um, around northern circumpolar societies that have also had an important influence on, on anthropological theory, um, particularly in relation to understanding humans and animals and to understanding animism as an ontology. So, so that, that's true. Um, but I'm not so sure about this, well, well the, about experimental. First of all, uh, there, are, there, are, there are at least two ways of thinking about the experiment here, and I think they need to be distinguished. Um, there's the natural science way of doing an experiment. You have a hypothesis, you set up an experiment to test it, and you get the results, and they either confirm the hypothesis or they show it needs some modification. That's not the way in which um, hunters... I was only talking about ethnoscience, yeah, know, like, you know, describing uh, naked science. But, 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 the, but the, worst about, the worst of the concept of ethnoscience is it does tend to take a scientific model into the way in which people relate to their, to their so-called folk. I get this, 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 therefore, there's, scien there's, 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 there's um, science science and folk science, and it's a bit awkward, because, because what the hunter is doing is improvising. It's, 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 it's a bit like the difference between chemistry and alchemy. And the modern chemist investigates systematically in the laboratory. An alchemist throws a whole lot of things together and sees what happens. And, 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 and a hunter, it, uh, is, as they're following the prey, uh, it, it, it is an experimental uh, attitude that they have in that they're, 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 they're always trying things out. But it... it um, it, it's, it's trying something out in the anticipation of what might emerge. It's not testing a hypothesis or uh, setting up observation against prediction in that sort of way. And there, there, it's hard but there is, there, to explain that there is, a, there is a real difference there. And I don't think, although you know, the, the blocks and the White Houses and the Boyes and the rest of them would, and the spare bears, with all, with all of whom I disagree fundamentally, because they're taking a basically cognitivist understanding of how knowledge is formed. And if you're a cognitivist, you, you, you have to say that um, in order to deal practically with anything in the world, you first have to have some sort of form, some sort of representation of it, and that means that you have to process sensory data into, uh, into uh, percepts. Uh, or of, of some kind or other. Um, my view is that um, is, is, is that which, which comes from Gibson is that one can perceive and deal with things um, quite directly in the course of, of dealing with them. For example, when my daughter was young, um, I had to teach her how to make an omelette. And to do that, you have to break an egg into a mixing bowl before you whisk up the egg. Uh, and uh, as anybody knows, to break the egg neatly, you have to bang it on the edge of the bowl and make just enough of a crack that when you open it, the egg it nicely opens and the egg goes into the bowl. If the crack is too big, because you've hit it too hard, then there's egg everywhere. If the crack is too small, because you haven't hit it hard enough, then you have to to get it open, and again there's egg everywhere. <laughs> so you have to hit it just the right amount. Now the problem is, and you won't find the solution in any recipe book, the problem is how do you know how hard to hit the egg against the bowl given that it depends on the thickness of the egg and you don't know what the thickness of the eggshell is until the egg is broken. <laughs> and everybody has a way of doing it, which is you tap once gently, and from the sound of that tap, you know intuitively how thick that eggshell is, and you know exactly how hard to tap the next time. So, we, so then I, uh, my daughter is holding the egg in her hand, I'm holding my hand on hers, and we're going up and down. On, on, the edge of the, on the edge of the bowl, and after a while, she gets the hang of it and learns the technique of how to break an egg in a bowl. Now, in that process of apprenticeship learning, there is no point at which you need to have these beliefs or representations or <laughs> whatever. 
uh, because this is it's it's a it's a sensibility because one's perception is being educated it is a sensibility that undergoes ontogenetic development it becomes just as much a part of you as for example if I'm learning to play the cello and I have to know exactly how to space my fingers to play in tune you know how the difference between a C and a D feels in your hand and that doesn't depend on any uh, sort of underlying representations because you haven't learnt it through the acquisition of representations you've learnt it through um, through what, what I've called following Gibson um, the education of attention so that that's my answer to that okay. but there's a fundamental theoretical <coughs> division um, within well, it's within anthropology it's also within psychology and between people who take take different different views on this and the, the interesting thing or rather the disturbing thing in a way, is, is that very often when, when you have a... Uh, in this case, it's, it, it's a problem that arises on the interdisciplinary interface between anthropology and psychology. And people like Boyer and Sperber uh, and, and, and Maurice uh, Bloch have all been working on this, on this anthropology-psychology uh, interface. When one discipline engages with another, which is a little bit outside its usual frame, it tends to go for the mainstream. So if anthropology engages with psychology, it tends to go to cognitive psychology because that's the mainstream in the discipline. When actually, I think that's a terrible mistake. And it was just the same when anthropology engaged with biology, it went for evolutionary biology rather than developmental biology. Again, terrible mistake. If anthropology had linked with developmental biology, we'd have a really good synthesis by now rather than the antagonism that's going on. And if anthropology had linked with uh, Vygotskyan developmental psychology or with Gibsonian ecological psychology rather than cognitive science, again, we'd be fine. But that's, that's my view. Would, would you consider, uh, sorry, just, just uh, the following, would you consider Gibson as a philosopher or as a psychologist? Oh, he's a psychologist. He's not a, he's, he's you I, I suppose you can't do psychology without engaging a bit with philosophy or having some philosophy at the back of your mind or adhering a bit to one position rather than another whether you're a realist or an idealist or whatever but, but, but Gibson was a very hard-nosed psychologist who simply said how do organisms perceive the world around them um, and he tried to answer that through very sort of experimental hard-nosed psychological techniques not by but he did, I, I think he did read Meloponti and he did read uh, you know, this and that, that mm. person um, but really was not, he was not a philosopher. With the result, w w one consequence of which is that when you read um, the ecological approach to visual perception, it is as clear as a bell, absolutely clear. You know what he's saying. You read a philosopher and think, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Did did Gene Lave's work at all influence you? Oh yes. On, on this point. Yes. Because some of what you're saying well, recalls of it what did. she yes. has to say about learning, apprenticeship, yes, yes, and her critique of um, the psychology of education yes. and the cognitive of course science it did. of education. And uh, Gene and I are very close friends. Um, we've known each other for a long time, and I'm uh, a great admirer of her work, and it has been very influential. Uh, with Jean, who was always saying that we should take psychology out of doors into the ordinary world that people inhabit, um, uh, so, and um, uh, and, and sh uh, the the activity theory, the Vygotskyan activity theory, um, that she and other people like uh, Barbara Rogoff and, and Mike Cole have been bringing into to anthropology um, has been um, very influential for me, and and the. And, and so the thinking about learning in terms of processes of apprenticeship um, is, comes quite directly from that, yes. So I'm happy to acknowledge her as a, as a gene, as, a, as an intellectual uh, inspiration, yes. Yes. The second uh, thing I was wondering Sorry, about, I about the second. was about your relationship to Deleuze and the Lazian uh, anthropologists, mm. because... Um, Nowadays, many anthropologists are interested in Deleuze, but it seems to me that, for example, Viva Rose de Castro, 
retains something in Deleuze which is totally different from the thing you, uh, you are interested in. Uh, because basically what he keeps or extracts from Deleuze is the uh, Leibnizian aspect of Deleuze. And uh, with his concept of perspectivism, mm. actually we are, in s we are very far from what you are proposing. You are talking about flows, about lines and so on. Um, perspectivism and the metaphysics of predation is all about very you know, circular entities. There is the prey, there is the predator, and they are interacting in a certain way. You can, the shaman can switch from one point of view to another and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is a very Leibnizian uh, understanding of Deleuze. And on the other hand, we have the more Bergsonian uh, aspect of uh, Deleuze. And it seems to me that, yeah, this is what you are interested that, in Deleuze. That is true. And uh, so I'd like to know what exactly is uh, uh, your relationship to Viveros de Castro. <laughs> and, uh, and also, uh, and she was at the, at the symposium on Durkheim, uh, Barbara Gloshevsky. Yeah. She's a Deleuzean or Guattarian, but sort of, yeah, yes. both. Uh, yes. And actually, her work on uh, Aboriginal art, for example, on conception of the yeah, on cosmology and so on, is, I would say, uh, closer to the um, uh, to the Bergsonian reading of Deleuze because what she says about Aboriginal cosmology is very, very similar to these uh, ideas of uh, lines and flows and so on. Yes. So uh, what is, well, your relationship to... Uh, okay. Uh, so so it, 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 it's absolutely true that it's the Bergsonian uh, si side of, uh, of Deleuze that, that attracts me to his work um, because I said I read Bergson ages ago and it, be, and it was so influential for me that it just became part of my taken-for-granted way of thinking so that I, I often find that I'm sort of looking at things in a Bergsonian kind of way without even realizing I'm doing it because it just becomes part of the way one thinks. And, 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 and that was important for me because this, this was also what I learned from the Sami. I mean, it, the, 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 that way of thinking was something I, 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 I realized I learned in the field and that's why you know, when I read Bergson, I was so excited by it, and, and, and so on. So these, these things all fit together, and they fit together with, very closely with, with, with Barbara's uh, work on Aboriginal people, uh, because it happens to fit um, pretty well with, um, with ethnographic, well, ethnographically documented uh, ways of, of moving and knowing. Uh, we certainly know from Aboriginal ethnography, but it's, you also find it in... I mean, I've been working with, uh, with the ethnography of hunting and gathering people, and you find the, the same thing uh, cropping up over and over again. Um, the Viveros de, I, I, uh, Viveros de Castro's work I, I know very well um, because, it, because the, 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 the logic of perspectivism does happen to, um, to fit uh, ex extremely well not only with um, with, with uh, Amazonian ontologies, but with people across the Circumpolar North as well. And it just so happens that that um, that Amazonia and Circumpolar North are very similar, but are, are, are very different from Melanesia and Australasia. And so it's, it's an ethnographic uh, point. So that um, what Viveros de Castro writes about perspectivism rings a lot of bells uh, because it. it fits with, uh, with, with what I know of, of circumpolar ethnography. I don't link that. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in linking that with Deleuze and Guattari. I mean, I'm, I'm just quite happy to keep that. That's per perspectivism. Um, we know what it means. Uh, and if I have a certain feeling about skepticism, a certain skepticism towards Ed Eduardo's uh, work, well, it's firstly that kind of grumpiness that it's not as though he, it was he who discovered it. In fact, um, you know, there, there, there's, he, he was merely um, formulating in a neat way uh, what is, has been described by numerous ethnographers from both in uh, uh, Amazonia and, and the Circumpolar North. Kai Orhem's work, for example, is a very little known uh, work on, on Amazonia. 
spelt the whole thing out about 10 years before Viveros de Castro and is never acknowledged and, and uh, Irving Hallowell in, uh, in, in Canada working with Ojibwe people and so on. So it's, it's not an, as novel as an approach as Eduardo, for rhetorical reasons, uh, makes it out to be. And, and, and he's also systematized it. He's, he's turned it into an intellectual project. Uh, the, the, the real puzzle with, with perspectivism is why should some people be perspectivists and others not? And why do you find it in Amazonia and across the circumpolar north, but not in Melanesia or uh, Western Europe after 1500 or whatever? Well, why do you find it in some places uh, rather than others? Um, and I, I think there is an answer, um, and I think, I think the answer is that if you're a hunter and you're spending a great deal of time in the company of animals, it's extremely difficult not to be a perspectivist. It's something that almost forces itself on you through uh, a deeply emotional experience, uh, a, a form of sentience that is impossible to resist. And I think that's the only way of explaining it. But that means that, that if you're going to have a theory of perspectivism, it has to be one that is underpinned by, I can't, don't have a better way of saying it than human feeling. It has to be a, it, it underpinned by a sense of, a sense of real visceral feeling of what it is like to be in the presence of other animals. And that's what I miss from Eduardo's account. It is too intellectualized. I, I, I've tried to explain, even to teach students about human-animal relations. You know, I have to say that that the, the first time when I was in a reindeer roundup and I was face to face with a reindeer that I had lassoed, and it, there, there it is, and, and it, you're eyeballing it. The intensity of that experience is, 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 is extraordinary. Um, and you can't just intellectualize that away. And I think it's that, that, it's that very fundamental experiential foundation for. Uh, for perspectivism that I think is missing from, uh, from Eduardo's his work. He's just too Parisian. He's too, 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 <laughs> being too clever by half. Uh, and that, that worries me about it. But anyway, so, so I, I, I haven't actually tried even to link perspectivism to Deleuze and Guattari. I just deal with perspectivism as perspectivism. That's an anthropological problem. Where I link up to Deleuze is, uh, is through the nomadology and the Bergsonian line, the lines and the rest of it. We still have some time to yeah, ask yeah. and it's like a couple of questions, but they are very... That's all right. Ten minutes. Um, so the first one is really specific. It's, do you, I mean, is there a reason, have you find any, I mean, the work of Charles uh, Pierce, any meaningful, or like the philosophy, Pierce and philosophy, any meaningful to you? Because I, I mean, I find a lot of really interesting things, and I like, think the way in which American anthropology is approaching many of these things now really respond to that, you know, the pragmatic tradition, which helps a lot to um, solve this divide between, like, mind and the world and mm. all this stuff. Mm. So if there is a reason why you haven't evoked the name or something like yeah, that. There is a, there, 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 there's a sort of a reason. Um, I mean, I know it, but I haven't, I haven't referred to it um, very much, although... Um, other pragmatists, um, uh, Dewey, uh, William James, if you go back to that, have been very influential and, 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 and important. Um, it, it has to do with my relation with, or the, my, um, my drawing on, on Gibson. See, there's, a, there's a, a, a piece of work that I think has still to be done, and that is to find out whether Pierce and Gibson were saying fundamentally different things, or whether they're actually saying exactly the same thing in a completely different language. I suspect it's largely the latter. Yeah. And I find Gibson's language of affordances clearer, uh, clearer more operational, uh, and more grounded than Pierce's, which I find often generates a good deal of 
sort of pseudo semi once you leave Paris and go into anthropology, you get a great deal of pseudo semiotic obscurity, which just seems to go around itself in circles, and I find that tiresome. Um, the, I, I think that one, once, you, once you accept um, a very broad concept of the sign, and once you allow in sort of biosemiotics, zoosemiotics, and the rest of it, then I don't know how one can distinguish the kind of semiotic sign speak of that kind of pragmatics from, um, from the ecological psychology approach, which is the one that I've adopted. So in a sense, if I, if I hadn't gone for Gibson, I might have gone for Peirce, but yeah. having gone for Gibson, it kind of... <laughs> I've, 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 that do, does the job for me, and I don't need Peirce. I have um, drawn a lot on the work of people like von Eckskuhl, who, of course, was the founder of biosemiotics. He, von Eckskuhl wasn't drawing on Peirce, but, on, but, but they, then, then they kind of link up, because they, they, they're all parts of a sort of grander semiotic approach. And I'll try to be clear about the second question. Is we is it is it you cannot hear me otherwise? <laughs> Just like it's really fine. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I'm just trying to think what's the status of when you think when you talk about production, for instance. It, it strikes me as a very universalistic. Um, mm you know, way of putting it, universalistic in both, you know, I say this in a critical and not critical way, in the sense that I don't know how to take, if this is like a local understanding of what production is, that somehow comes out of your field work experience, and, or if it's, a, if it's a, um, in, other, in other words, like what would be in, in your way of understanding these different things, you know, dwelling, production, etc., what is the place of what you know, all anthropologists used to call endic category. Mm -hmm. In other words, whether you know the ways in which people which are involved in these processes, if that way of conceiving these things affects the process, mm. and whether, for instance, we can say that, like, you know, the, the very reason why a Marxist approach to it was non satisfactory for you at the beginning was because it was a, it belonged to a certain it was an endic description of the world, you know, proper to modernity, capitalism, whatever. Mm -hmm. Which you are in a way trying to overcome in, you know, through thought. But you know, what's the relation between the mm. possibility of thinking otherwise and actually transforming the world, or something like that? Or what is the role of you know, mm. if you take your own work to be some sort of um, local understanding of the world, which you know, comparable to that of other cultures or whatever? What is you know, what is the place of that reflexive? Um, I don't know. I, am I being clear? Yes, you're being yeah. perfectly clear. Okay. And and and. I mean, the reason why I took up production as a kind of key word at, at that time in the 1980s was that that was the sort of central concept that a whole lot of debates at that time were spinning around. Uh, that um, so it was a you know, if if you were going to engage with debates at at that time, that was a word that you had to contend with in just the same way. Um, more recently, uh, everybody's been talking about consumption. We have consumption studies. Mm -hmm. And I think consumption studies have been awful because they've occluded consumption. They've occluded the, the making, the creating, the growth of things. And we need to get back to a focus on production. But, but the thing about a word like production, which makes it so, so powerful in a way, is that, is that you can, it's a word that has a history. And, 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 and you can mean very different things by it. So, so one of the things I've wanted to argue is precisely that, that, we, that, that we need to get away from thinking of, of production as um, the, uh, the imposition of, of designs uh, uh, onto material and, and think of it in, as production, meaning to bring forth uh, uh, reveal, um, and that is a much older meaning of the word, and if it comes from, 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 from ductus, the Latin word ductus, which is a wonderful word, used a lot by medieval philosophers to refer to the flow, the movement of, of life and thought, and pro as a before, putting before, or bringing, so the production means, means a kind of drawing forth of things. So that one can use this word in, in a way um, 
to, 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 to do a, you, you can criticize production with production. You can, you can, you can use the word to, uh, to, to, to launch a critical argument, uh, to, to set one understanding of what it means to make things against another understanding of what it means to make things. And both can be brought under the same word, production, because production can mean different things. And that's what, what kind of gives it, gives it a power. It's the same with lines. I mean, they're, they're <clears throat> from, from Paul Clay, I, I, I've very sort of taught me that um, initially, he taught me about it, I read, that, that, that there are basically two kinds of line. There's, there's the point-to-point -point connector, which is the Euclidean line, the shortest distance between two points. And there's the line that goes for a walk. And so I got this distinction between the point-to-point -point connector and, and this line, and, and, and was, uh, realized that when everybody says that Western thought is linear, or is, they're attacking, criticizing the linearity of Western thought, it turns out that it's this kind of linearity they're attacking and not that kind. So that under the, this wonderful notion of the line, you can actually set up an argument in which one sort of line argues with another kind of line. And, and you develop know, something out of that. Like, like this, a little thing. Yeah. I think that um, at least American anthropology has, I mean, is too much in love with the idea that there is modernity and non modernity. Oh, yes. Yes. Right? And like, and that's what I find really refreshing in your work, that in a way this divide is not operating there. That no. you know, there is a, a much more like fluid translation between yeah. um, these different so there is not um, I mean anthropology doesn't become um, an endeavor to like find the non mother, hmm. right? As um, but that, it, yeah. yet it is you know, clearly I mean in this attempt to you know, overcome the human, non human divide, etc. I mean there is course, as some sort of like a really rich influence from um, your fieldwork, I guess, or yes, yes, there is. But it, but I agree with you entirely, and that, that, that about the anthropological obsession with uh, with modernity and non-modernity, and 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 it, it produces a peculiar kind of presentism in which it seems as though you know, the whole of human history is balancing on this fulcrum of uh, of the transition from the modern to the postmodern, or the pre-modern to the modern, or something like that. It's extraordinary telescoping of history, as though the whole of, of uh, the whole history of Chinese thought, the whole history of Arab thought, the whole history of Japanese right. thought, mm. Mm, as though there never was any Indian science. I mean, we're supposed to be anthropologists, and yet we, we, we were writing about history as though the whole thing hinged on, 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 on the fate of modernity. It seems to me extraordinarily narrow-minded, and, and so I, I, I agree. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm very attracted by medieval philosophy, which is extremely anthropological. In I mean, me, I'm thinking of, of medieval Christian philosophy that's sort of before the Renaissance in the, in, in the West, um, the sort of monastic traditions of, of, of Christian philosophy, which are, which, which are really interesting and really anthropological. And they, because because those philosophers were not having to set their ideas against, or they were not having to use modernity as a foil against which to set their ideas because modernity hadn't happened yet. So you could just bypass all of that. And it's, anyway, that was it. Could I please add yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, But I, I think I have questions related to yours, okay. or one, one question. Because some of what I heard of what you were saying is that despite Granted, modernity, non modernity distinctions in, in US, that's what you meant by American anthropology, is that I, d despite, despite that, um, there's still a, a relevance to it in as much as there's always a danger in even a project like yours, which is very critical of um, uh, dominant social scientific categories, dominant categories, or approaches to cognition, and so on, of introducing new concepts of new metaphysics that then become universalizing. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's very common today uh, in the United States you know, that you encounter Deleuzean anthropology or Deleuzean humanities mm -hmm. in which flow, line, movement, um, maybe even something like intrinsic production um, play a kind of role in a master category. Mm -hmm. And 
so how do you, to put the question in not you know, too critical fashion, how, how do you avoid I think it had, in yeah, a universal I know. sense? Is, are, yeah. there, are there lines peculiar to Chinese thought, Chinese practices, or if you cite them, Indian philosophy and so on, mm -hmm. that allow for differences or different forms that you account for? Or is the line somehow universal and well, it, 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 you're not concerned with the variations. Yeah. Well, in a in, in in a certain kind of way, it is it, it is universal in the same way that one might say that it um, that um, it is a universal condition for human knowledge that we actually inhabit a world, and you might say, okay, that's a universal. It's not a very helpful. But, I mean, it's kind of it's almost a truism, and they're, they're, so so to say that life. If, if I say you know life is lived along lines. Universal proposition. It's, it, it's well. It, I think it is, but it's it's universal in a in a rather trivial sense because one's simply talking about a, an existential necessity. Um, what I I really dislike about the sort of um, Deleuze and this and Foucault and that and the rest of it is 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 so much of it is um, is vacuous rhetoric that is being produced in order to play an intellectual game and get one's papers published or pay lip service to one people or another. I, I, I cannot see any... I, my, my, my own strategy would be um, to, uh, to invoke the philosophies um, only as at, at, at the end point of a struggle of trying to make sense of the immediate observation and experience of, of things, um, which is why um, I often find myself uh, lying in the way that academics often do, um, that, that through, through, through thinking through something on the basis of my own observations and experiences, I come to some something that I say that, that, that for example, I, I might say through thinking through, through, through things, I, um, I, I've come to this distinction, that, that this idea that there's a fundamental difference between the point-to-point -point connector and the trace of a gesture. In fact, two kinds of lines. And I thought that through, with a little help from Clay and a few other people, but I thought it through. I would then um, maybe go to Deleuze and find it, this distinction. So then what do I do when I write it up? Influenced by Deleuze, there are, or, or referring to Deleuze, there are two kinds of lines. So, so when it comes to the publication, it, I make it look as though I actually got the idea from a philosopher and I'm applying it to the world when actually it was the other way around. And it was much better than it was the other way around. And it's because people are going back to front, because people are thinking that the knowledge is in the books and they'd then better see if it apply it in the world, rather than that the knowledge is in the world and then we've got to put it into books. It's because people are going back to front in their academic work that I think we get this, uh, this vacuous rhetoric, which I think is doing an awful lot of harm to the humanities. We, we, we shouldn't go on for more than... Five minutes to get. But you know, I have this. It's really good. Cool. It's just that um, so I'm a student of anthropology at Columbia University, mm -hmm. and it's just I'm imagining of this situation because you know it's like a very personal, you know, setting. So I, I'm just going to ask it. It's really like a technical question, and it's what do you think about this style of ethnography? I mean, like, I mean, what do you think? Um, what would be for you the ideal style of an ethnography that would you you would want to read? You know, from one of your students who goes to film work, right. and you know, like, and I'm asking these, you know, from a personal, you know, like, I just I, I've been like two years in Mali and I'm back and I have to write this dissertation, and mm -hmm. there is this whole thing about like what's the voice, and yes. and there is all these like alerts against, um, you know, having an authoritative discourse versus like the native mm -hmm. words, and but then the thing is that how do you solve that? How do you write something that? somebody else would want to write, but it's not just like... You know what, I think what I like to read is something that I know is the writer's own voice speaking to me. 
And because everybody has different voices, it means that there is no one particular style, but that the ideal ethnography is one that is not written in a particular genre of, that you could find on the shelf. You can have this way, this way, this way, this way. You can be highly narrative, you can be highly contextual, you can be very scientific. Or, the, 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 but but um, the, the, a, a, really, a really good ethnography well, a really good one is also one that's able to sort of bring uh, quite deep philosophical ideas into us, uh, uh, and to talk about to talk about deep things at the same time as talking about what look like very simple acts like cooking a meal or something. I mean, that's, that's the best ethnography is the thing that manages to work on on all these different levels at once. I think, and it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, you know, rather than having a theory chapter and then the description and so on, but to, to manage to, 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 to engage with things both register, to register on, on these, these different levels at once. But, 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 but a, a really satisfying work that is really satisfying to read for me is work that when you read it, it's as though you can, he as though the writer, the ethnographer, is there talking to you that you can really sense his or her presence, um, not as sort of somebody in the field, but, 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 but as, as, as the writer, that you can, that, that with their own personality, their own voice, their own way of doing things, which is, which is another way of saying that there should not be a standard model, because everybody is different. And if you think about novels or terrible I never read novels but 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 you think you know, every particular writer has their own particular style and we we appreciate them and value them because of the way they bring their way of voicing things to the page and I uh, the, the one thing that I try to do in my own writing is to uh, and I mean I read it out loud and make sure that it sounds right and, and I want to write in a way that somebody reading it can feel that I'm there talking to them. Um, and that's what I liked, what I valued most. Uh, I'll just ask my question from here, because uh, the wireless microphone has the battery. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so um, from what uh, I understood, you, you're, you're rather skeptical towards ontology, since it has no real uh, empirical basis. Um, at least from what I uh, understood from uh, the, the, the quote uh, of Frédéric Keck. And um, I was wondering, well, um, don't you think that in a way uh, you, it, you cannot avoid um, implicit ontological commitments in your way of uh, speaking of uh, persons, objects, uh, social entities, etc. And uh, and I, I'm not real. Um, I'm also uh, referring to the, the great deal of work uh, in contemporary analytical uh, metaphysics uh, uh, about um, uh, continuant metaphysics or um, four-dimensionalism or all these kind of metaphysics of uh, uh, processes, which is not uh, in the same tradition as. Uh, process uh, philosophy or uh, Whitehead and Deleuzian philosophy, but uh, which is um, considering, for instance, persons as, as four-dimensional objects, and and um, uh, of, uh, often uh, represents it at, uh, as lines or mm. uh, uh, four-dimensional. Uh, processes so it, it it seems to me that it is quite similar that what you are uh, um, trying to to no I'm not I'm, I'm, I'm not against ontology um, and and I wouldn't um, I wouldn't sort of suggest because it would be nonsense to say that we, we can only have ontology if it's got an empirical foundation because that would be um, it's assuming an ontology in the first place to, so so uh, and, and so, for example, I've written a lot about the animic ontology and what kind of sense of being that entails. Um, and, and, and I've talked about the ontological commitments of people who have um, that way of, of, of being in the world. Um, 
that rests on, on openness rather than closure. So I'm not um, uh, the, the for anthropology the, the, the really critical question at the moment which is much debated now that anthropologists are using the word ontology a lot is whether ontology is just another word for, for culture or whether it's something else that, that, that there's much anthropological writing when people will talk about multiple ontologies and Amazonian ontology mm. and Western ontology and African ontology and as uh, many ontologies as you like mm. and, yeah. and uh, so everybody's seeing the world in terms of their own particular ontologies and it looks like, looks suspiciously like old-fashioned cultural relativism dressed up in, in new clothes um, and I think it is much of it but that doesn't mean we should then get rid of ontology, but we then have to think about, about ontology in a, in a, a, at a more fundamental level. What are the... Um, uh, and th then, then the problem is, can there, be a, can there be a project of comparing ontologies? Now, Philippe Descola, of course, has such a project. He's got four ontologies and he's been comparing them for the last 20 years. Um, I don't think you can do that because I think the comparison depends on privileging one of those ontologies, namely the naturalistic one, in the first place because that provides the framework within which the others are, 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 are compared. I still think one can have... Another way of saying it, but perhaps one should start, stop thinking about ontology as this or that system that one could pick up and say, no, on, ontology... The word on top, it's, it's the same thing I would say about words like nature and culture to students. I would say culture is, not, is the name of a question. It is not the answer to the question. The question is why are humans different? You can't answer that question by culture or it's circular. Same about nature. You might say nature is a question about why are people or things the same. Um, but you can't answer that question by saying because of their nature because that would be entirely circular. Ontology is a question about being. And it's a question about what, what are the conditions of being? And, and, and then we can look and see what those conditions are. But we can't simply say the answer is ontology. Because again, that would be going around in a circle. So is life an ontological principle? It's an ontological problem. It's, it's like culture, it's the name of a problem. Yeah, mm. I think so. It's the name and, of a problem. But it's a better problem than culture. I do think so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you're going to have to, if you're going to have an ultimate principle, I, I wouldn't mind nailing life to. <laughs> if we're going to have one, um, I would certainly prefer life to some of the other alternatives on offer. But I say that because it, it seems I, I could be wrong. I'm just basically someone who said it to some of these things that are more like whether they're different forms, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Cultures, ontologies, but, historical situations, whatever. Yeah, but, 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 but without, I mean, if, if you say that life is some sort of generative potential, I mean, without that generative potential, there wouldn't be anything. Um, there were, we, we wouldn't be. I don't, and so it's a bit like, it's about a bit like you know, Marx saying that, um, that um, you know, without, uh, without production, um, in his sense, uh, there wouldn't be, a world, there wouldn't be us, there wouldn't be anything yeah. going on, and th then all, all the other stuff follows on, but here we are, and um, that's where we start off from, and in a way that, that's a sort of argument for the primacy of life, I think. Sort of. Thanks. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you.